in this chapter that um, I do not believe that we can make our points without actually reading it. But before we read it, uh, Gary and Lynette, we're so happy to have you from Quincy and also Dale in India. And I think since the last time we saw you, you got married. Congratulations. It's nice to see you folks. <clears throat> All right, let's, uh, let's read. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I'll turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. And I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. To the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold... The cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you. That I have sent you when you have brought the people out of, the, out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and Jacob, have appeared to me, saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, and Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to your voice, and you and the elders of of Israel shall go out to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of Hebrews, has met with us, and now please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Israel will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. But each woman shall ask her neighbor. And each woman will, who lives in her house for, uh, for silver and gold and jewelry and for clothing, you shall put them to your um, sons. Uh, on your sons and on your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is in your hand? He said, A staff. And he said, Throw it on the ground. 
So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, Put your hand, put forth your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it. And it became a staff in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, Put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then God said, Put your hand back into your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. If they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the ground. And the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seen or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to say. But he said, Oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses and said, Is there not air, is there not air in your brother the Levite? I know, what he can, I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him, and take in your hand this staff with which you shall go do signs. That's a long reading, isn't it? But boy, isn't there a lot of things there? That we don't have time to cover in 15 minutes. <laughs> Took 15 minutes to read it. But we have a couple points that we want to make before we end this lesson. Will you bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, bless this reading and this lesson in our hearts. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to go forth from this place being touched by the possibilities that you have in store for us. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of this sermon, if you noticed in the newsletter, is Surprised by a Burning Bush. We find that Moses was surprised by what he saw. He saw a burning bush. Now that wasn't odd, but the oddity about this is that he noticed that a burning bush was burning, but the bush was not being consumed. And so he was surprised by that. So he said, I will go check this out. So he walked close by, and then all of a sudden he was surprised by what he heard. A voice came out of that burning bush. He heard God speaking to him. Moses was surprised by what he felt. He felt the presence of God. When the Lord told him to remove his sandals from off his feet because the place upon which he was standing was holy ground, he sensed the awesome presence of the Almighty God. What was simply to him some strange phenomenon became a great surprise for him. Moses was surprised because he felt the very presence of God. Moses was surprised by God's call to service. Moses was content to be a herdsman for his father-in-law, away from his people who were suffering in the throes of pain and suffering of slavery. And here Moses, just living a contented life um, outside of uh, Egypt, not worrying about a thing. But now he was surprised because God said, you are going to be my messenger. You're going to go down there and you're going to talk to Pharaoh and God is going to uh, work through you mighty miracles and you're going to lead my people. 
Could a very special moment with God be a turning point in our lives? We may not see a burning bush, but there are opportunities that God is really speaking to us and saying, can I have your attention? And if we have eyes to see, we may find a very special moment with God and it might be a turning point in our lives. You know, God still surprises. He still surprises us all. It's amazing in all my years, and I think you could probably tell me a few stories of your own accounts of where you were really surprised at the outcome of certain things that looked hopeless or situations that you were totally um, dissatisfied about. But hanging in there, it opened a door a vision to a greater opportunity of service. And because you hung in there, it turned out to be a blessing in disguise. And so God still surprises. And so, number two, God still sees. What did God see when he told Moses that he looked down and he could see the suffering and the mistreatment of his people in Egypt? He says, I have seen their burden. I have seen their difficulties. And I am going down and I'm delivering my people. And so the concerns of God's people in Egypt at that time moved God with great compassion to help and alleviate that very quickly through Moses. Does God see us cry out in our burdens, in our sin, and in our sorrow? Could God see that Moses could lead his people? Christ leads us out of our bondage. Christ leads us into opportunities. And so God still sees. God still surprises. He looks down upon us and he's touched Jesus It says in Hebrews, is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. God still sees. And next, we discover from this passage of scripture that he sent Moses to be the deliverer. And God still sends us as well. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, we are told to go and make disciples of all nations. God still sends imperfect people to do his job. So often we make excuses like Moses. Oh, I'm inadequate. I can't speak as well as others. And I don't know how. I'm too weak. I'm inept. I I just, just can't do it. Send someone else. Let somebody else do it. Moses came up with every excuse in the book to justify his desire not to go. And so, does this story strike close to home? Is the old excuse, let George do it, our excuse Are there things that we can do if we just put our mind to it? Or are we finding excuses not to do the things that we ought to do? On Sunday nights, we're talking about how how do we share the Lord with people? And it's very simple. It's very clear. We make it too complicated. You don't have to memorize a hundred verses to teach a person about the Lord. Share your story. Tell people what the Lord did in leading you to Christ and how that happened. It's not that difficult, but we have made it difficult and we truly believe in our excuses. Now, the fourth thing is God still saves. What God did through Moses resulted in a great blessing. He delivered the people from Egyptian bondage. 
He preserved a people all the way down to the time of Christ. The promises to Abraham were fulfilled through the Jewish people. And Jesus was born under the law, born of a woman, Galatians 4 and verse 4, in the right time, in the fullness of time. God still delivers today. In 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 7, Paul says, We have this gospel in earthen vessels. And what he's actually saying is God communicates his word through frail, fragile people as an earthen vessel. You drop an earthen vessel, it'll shatter shatter in a million pieces. We are like those earthen vessels. God takes us in our imperfections, in our weaknesses, and in our inadequacies, and he uses that to accomplish his purposes. He doesn't need the wisest people in the world or the strongest people in the world. He just needs common people like us. And we must trust that the power is not in us, But in the gospel, Romans 1 and verse 16, it is the power of God unto salvation. So often we are hesitant because we we don't think that we can be as convincing as we need to be or that we are not as intelligent as the person that we're teaching or that we're just insecure and inadequate and turn inward. But the power is not in us. And that's why God has chosen earthen vessels so that people will not take the credit, but give all credit to God. It was difficult to convince Moses. And Moses' willingness to cooperate with God resulted in a chain of events that led to the delivery of the people of Israel and began a great work to a point where Moses was the great leader that God knew that he would be. In Philippians 1 and verse 6, Paul says, I know that God will complete the work that he began in you and bring it to completion at the day of his coming. So God isn't through with us yet. And so it is God working in us to will and to do for his good pleasure, Ephesians chapter 2. And so... We may not have a burning bush, but God's word is, should be a burning fire within us. Jeremiah 20 and verse 9. This verse is always an encouragement to, to me over the years when I felt like it was, it, it'd be best for me to let somebody else take over. Jeremiah says, if I refuse to speak or utter his name, there is within me a burning fire and I cannot contain I am so filled with a desire to share God's word. I cannot contain it. And the more we know God's word and when we see people not living according to God's will, we should be just burning with desire to share with them the truth of God's love. I truly believe that God will equip us for the task that he's given us. And do not turn away from those closest moments when God is nearest to us. Moses, if he was not curious, could have said, oh, well, that's just another burning bush and never looked, noticed the, the distinction between a common burning bush and the burning bush that would not consume the bush. He had enough curiosity to say, I'm going to check it out. So we need to make sure we don't turn away from our closest moments with God, but act upon it and believe that God may work wonders through our lives and the results will be surprising. Moses just thought it was just another day, a day of, uh, of routine with his herds. And he had taken them back to the sheepfold later. But what was a common day turned into being a very uncommon day. A day full of surprises. And God can turn any ordinary day in our day into great blessings. Not only for us, but for others who are around us. We should be a blessing to others in every circumstance. I would hope that if anybody carried a conversation with me anywhere, that they would leave and say, you know... That was really a nice conversation. 
And I would hope that somebody would say, you know, I believe that person is a Christian. And I believe that we can make a difference if people know what we are and who we are. And so may we individually and as a congregation to listen to what God says to us because time is fleeting. And where we are spiritually at this very moment may be a high point in our lives that may never ever come back unless we nurture it by taking those opportunities that God provides us. Every day should be a day of surprises for each one of us. Every day should be filled with opportunities to do something for others or to reflect the joy and love of the Lord to others. And so, what do you say to a God that's inviting you through his surprises? Serendipity is a real powerful word, and I'm sure that uh, it, it is filled with uh, examples of your life that, that something happened that wasn't, uh, wasn't expected, that you discovered something that you never even were looking for. You can read scripture, and serendipity has been the grounds for a lot of sermons for you folks. Just reading scripture, and all of a sudden something jumps off the page, and so, wow, I've never seen that before. But we have to have eyes to see and ears to hear. We've got to sense God's presence in our daily life. Jesus says, I will never leave you. And he used a powerful statement. He says, I will not leave you orphans. But I will send the Holy Spirit and he will dwell with you forever. God's presence is with us, folks. And that is empowering to us to know that God is has a special place and a special mission for each one of us. And we are poor judges of greatness because Jesus said, those that would be great, let him be your servant. He that would be first will be last, and those that are last shall be first. And Jesus says that God will not forget us giving a cup of cold water to another human being. Don't minimize the little things. They add up to be great things for a lot of people. We're going to sing the encouragement song that Gary has selected, and we hope that if you need to respond for prayer or for baptism, we're here to accommodate your needs, whatever they might be. Please come as we stand and as we sing.